In the name of the risen Christ, amen. Given all that you're holding in your heart right now and all that's happening in our world, it might help to know or remember that resurrection is a process more than an event. And it begins while it's still dark. The first stirrings of a new life new hope and possibility in the wake of loss, those stirrings are generally hidden from us. It's like the sprouts from a seed that haven't yet broken through the soil, or the healing that's taking place deep within our bodies while on the surface we're, we're still in pain. You may not feel anything at all this Easter morning. Not to worry. Think of Mary rising early that morning, that first Easter morning, rising if she ever slept at all, making her way towards Jesus' tomb while it was still dark with no expectation that there would be anything other than the somber work of grief waiting for her there. But that's how resurrection began for her, below the surface of her expectations. We often speak of Mary as the first witness to the resurrection, which she was, but she was more than that. Walking toward the tomb while it was still dark, Mary was as much a part of that first resurrection as Jesus rising from the dead. She was rising too. And rest assured, that God will summon us as well, wake us up in the middle of the night if need be, and propel us forward before we realize that anything has changed. God will do this. God will get us moving so that we don't miss the opportunity to choose life again. Movement is key in resurrection. I think our bodies know before our minds do that something is stirring. Both Jesus and Mary were moving forward, you know. Don't hold on to me, Mary, he said to her when they met at last in the garden. There was no looking back for him. There was no standing still, only forward movement. That's how it is with resurrection. A friend said to me recently, I will go anywhere as long as it's forward. That's the stirring of resurrection. Now, in the third chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus says that we can only speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. So if we're to speak of resurrection, we have to experience it. And I've been thinking all week about what I can say from experience about resurrection. And this is still a work in progress, but here goes. First, a bit about the context. We live, we live in a world of such profound contradiction, intense beauty, and harsh, unforgiving natural phenomenon a seemingly natural order of things and mind-boggling chaos. Within myself and every other person I know, there lies the full range of human possibility, our highest aspirations, our most base behavior, and not to mention, as Annie Lunoff once said, all that is mediocre and merely boring. It's all inside us. As human beings, we're capable of the most exquisite artistic expression, scientific discovery, physical accomplishment, and of stunning mean-spiritedness, petty cruelty, and acts of war. We're both self-centered and altruistic. We're stingy and generous. We're anxious and brave. We like to think of ourselves as independent, independent thinkers, 
And yet we are susceptible to forces of sophisticated manipulation that prey on insecurities and have us herd together and do all sorts of things in a crowd that we would never do on our own. We are, spiritually speaking, both saint and sinner. We can be hopelessly lost and miraculously found. And there is more suffering in this world than any heart should hold. None of us is spared suffering, some of which we bring on ourselves, much we cause others through personal and systemic patterns that Scripture calls sin, all the ways we fail one another, ourselves, and God. And so, into this wondrous, confusing, beautiful, broken God world and life, God comes to us. And to those called to follow him, God comes in the person of Jesus. And just as he came as a human being 2,000 years ago now, who, as the author of Acts describes him, went around doing good, he comes to us now as the risen Christ. He comes in solidarity. He comes with forgiveness. He comes with unconditional love and these gifts of resilience and mercy and grace. But he doesn't take away our suffering. I wish that he did, but he doesn't. What he does is hold it with us, and he goes down with us when we're forced to go all the way down, you know, to the point of death, our physical death, certainly, but also all the other ways we experience death in this life. And there we sit. And then, while it's still dark, we realize that we're rising and we're moving without knowing how we got started. And it begins to dawn on us as we move that something might be different, that something new is happening. It's as if for a time we're carried or led, invited to walk through a door that we didn't know was there. And it's, it's not clear, it doesn't feel familiar, and sometimes we, we hold back. We, we actually resist this because we've grown accustomed to the dark. But whatever it is that's stirring in us beckons us on and we go. There is sorrow involved here, and a part of us doesn't want to go for a whole host of reasons, but this energy is propelling us forward toward life. It's not an easy road because life is never easy, but it's life. It's life for us to choose and to live. Now, my first experiences of what, uh, what theologians call this cruciform reality of death and resurrection that we live over and over again, both personally and communally. My, my first experience of this were, were very small, and they were deeply personal. Um, I've known death of a dream. I've known death of relationships. I've, I've lost some physical capabilities that were precious to me, I, and losses of other kinds. I once in the midst of a, of a devastating loss at the time, I, I stumbled into a church, it happened to be Easter Sunday, and I heard this sermon about little deaths and little resurrections, a kind of corny sermon, actually, in which the preacher described these things that happened to us as practice for the ultimate resurrection that awaits us at the end. And there was just something in his words or God's stirring, I don't know, but I felt for the first time in months that I was willing to believe that I could live again. And amazingly so, life came back, and I felt myself rise toward it, toward a new life that God had begun in and for 
me. It wasn't the first time I had experienced that kind of death, and it certainly wasn't the last, and you'd think it would get easier with experience, but you know, with each loss, the loss is just as fresh. Each journey through the dark is just as dark as the last. But it does become familiar. It's one of the reasons why we circle around this story every single year to remind ourselves what it's like and so that it becomes for us a way of life and a way of looking at the world through this prism of the cross and resurrection. And that, that's something to hold on to right now, this cross and resurrection rhythm and pattern of life because we are on the precipice now as a people of so much stirring so much suffering all around us and it's important that we remember that resurrection is not an individual journey alone it is communal and as important as our individual stories of resurrection are and and they are important in god's God's dream, resurrection is for all of us, toward what Jesus called the kingdom of God here on earth, what Martin Luther King called the beloved community, a world aligned with God's dream, with God's love, God's justice for all humankind. And just as we have a part to play in our own rising, we have a part to play in, in this communal rising up, this planting of the kingdom of God, this fruition of the beloved community. And it happens whenever we find ourselves or place ourselves, as Jesus did, in situations of suffering or of brokenness or injustice, when we, and, and when we accept it, accept that suffering as the cost of love and of not only our personal transformation, but societal transformation as well. That's when resurrection flows through us. We show up in places that are beyond hope or where it seems that there is no hope, where it's still dark and we don't see anything. And when resurrection occurs there, stirred by a power that is not ours, we're among those walking toward a new horizon with other people, toward a dream that God has for us all. And no one knew that better. No one knew that promise of communal suffering and resurrection better than Martin Luther King Jr., who was assassinated 53 years ago today, April 4th, 1968. Such a poignant contrast to have Easter celebration on that day of such searing memory. But it's a fitting one, I think, after a year of so much loss. I can't stop thinking about King and that last week of his life that began right here in this pulpit and ended with a bullet on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel. You see, King believed in the power of what he called redemptive suffering. Suffering like Jesus for love and for justice, for peace and goodwill among all people. He walked in faith while it was still dark. Now, he wasn't a perfect man, we know that, but he, he never seemed to waver from this, this path of sacrificial love and redemptive suffering. He believed it for himself, for his own people, and incredibly enough, in his generous heart, for everyone else. He never gave up on love. And his faith, while it was communal, was also deeply personal. One of the last requests he made before he died, apparently, was for the singer Mahalia Jackson to sing his favorite song at that night's prayer meeting. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, help me stand. Through the dark, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me on. 
I'm persuaded that God calls each one of us, just like that, to walk toward the dawn while it's still dark. Jesus taking our hand, trusting that it will not always be night for ourselves or for others, because that is God's dream. And it's our way of living on this earth until then, as best we can, in sacrificial and healing love. So no matter where you are on this resurrection journey, take heart this Easter morning. Christ is risen and so have you. God is God. And by the grace of God, you are who you are, called to walk with Jesus toward the light, even while it's still dark. And so now, let the words that brought such hope and reassurance to Dr. King speak to you now. Let the risen Lord take your hand and lead you on to the light of resurrection. Amen.